Hello and welcome to the Walkthrough Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to tackle the question, do we need the police? To address this question, I think it's best to look at organized law enforcement and its relationship to the black community from three perspectives, historical, sociological, and political slash legal. The best place to start is likely at the beginning of our nation's founding all the way back to 1704 in South Carolina, where there was the organization and creation of the slave patrol or the patty rollers. Now, this was a group of white men that were armed and responsible for enforcing two types of laws, the slave codes and the fugitive slave laws. These men were selected in South Carolina and Virginia, as an example, from state militias and Southern military academies. This provided the group with military organization and structure to specifically, quote, detect, encounter, and disband any and all organized slave meetings that might lead to rebellion or revolt. Because at this time, the idea was the two most valuable possessions that a rich person would have that generated wealth was their land and their slaves. And the slave patrol was critical in ensuring that there was no slave rebellion, nor would slaves be able to escape. They were responsible for patrolling boundaries in between states, specifically in the north, escaping through the north, and in the south, escaping through the south through the Underground Railroad. And in the south, Black Americans were able to meet up with Native Americans in the Deep South all the way to Florida and would actually make sovereign communities with the Native Americans there, forming the Seminole Tribe. So there was already a space where Black Americans were able to live sovereign and free lives, and the Slave Patrol actively impeded, stopped, and destroyed opportunities to achieve that life. In fact, the state of Georgia was founded as a stopgap to prevent migration, southern migration specifically, of black Americans into Florida for this very reason. And if you look at the doctrines of the slave patrol and their duties, there are some things that you'll see there that sound eerily familiar. Tell me if this sounds familiar. They were in charge of, quote, apprehending runaways, monitoring the rigid pass requirements for blacks traversing the countryside, breaking up large gatherings, visiting and searching slave quarters randomly, inflicting impromptu punishment and suppressing insurrections. So they were allowed to enter slave quarters and randomly and indiscriminately punish black slaves for minor indiscretions. This level of immorality, this level of abuse and control on the black Americans led eventually to the American Civil War and the end of slavery, which was codified with the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which stated, neither slavery nor servitude shall exist within the United States, except as a punishment for crime. So what happened? The slave codes were transformed into the black codes or black laws. And this effectively reversed or nulled the 13th Amendment in many ways. Specifically, it denied equal political rights, including the right to vote to black Americans. It denied the right to attend public schools. It denied the right to equal treatment under the law. In fact, under the black codes, there was something called vagrancy laws, which allowed for the arrest of free people for minor offenses and commit them to involuntary servitude. So basically, under the black codes, it was illegal to be black. This perversion of the law and its unjust enforcement at that time led to two infamous events. 
the Memphis and the New Orleans riots of 1866. And I want to pay particular attention to the New Orleans riots of 1866 because it was also known as the New Orleans Massacre. And I want to set the stage for you guys. On July 30th, 1866, a group of black protesters with their marching band met outside the Mechanical Institute. They were there to protest the denial of the black vote in the Louisiana Constitution. Just around the corner, there was a mob of white Democrats and ex-Confederates who were waiting for these protesters. History is unclear about what happened, but within minutes when the two groups met, there was extreme and utter violence. And I just want to share with you a very graphic depiction of what happened. Quote, whites stomped, kicked, and clubbed the black marchers mercilessly. Policemen smashed the institute's windows and fired indiscriminately until the floor was slick with blood. Some people leaped from windows and were shot dead when they landed. Those lying on the ground were stabbed repeatedly, their skulls bashed in with bats. The sadism was so wanton that men who kneeled and prayed for mercy were killed instantly. This level of violence and this levels of atrocity led in 1868 to the passing of the 14th and 15th Amendment, where the federal government was basically said, all right, I guess we have to say line by line what it means to be equal and what it means to give black Americans their rights. So let's do this together, shall we? Clause number one of the 14th Amendment, citizenship clause, black people or people of African descent are U.S. citizens and are afforded the same rights. Clause number two, the privileges or immunities clause. There are no racist laws, basically. You cannot take away someone's immunities of a citizen just because they're black. Clause number three, due process clause. You cannot deprive someone of their life, liberty, and property without fair procedure. Clause number four, equal protection clause. Citizens and non-citizens are afforded equal protection in any jurisdiction. Couldn't be any more clear. And on top of that, in 1870, there was the 15th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied based on race, color or previous conditions of servitude so if you're black if you were a slave if your grandparents were slave doesn't matter you have the right to vote these three amendments 13 14 and 15 were known as the reconstruction amendments and under the reconstruction act the federal government actually kicked the South out of the Union, sent military occupation of the South, and ensured that these amendments would be ratified in the Southern States Constitution before they would be accepted back into the Union. So here we are. We have three amendments to the Constitution. If you didn't know, passing amendments in the Constitution is very difficult, and we passed three of them back to back. And we had military occupation of the South to ensure that black sovereignty was protected. So you would think 1870, we're good, right? Wrong, because the slave codes, which transformed into the black codes, eventually, transformed into the Jim Crow laws. Now this lasted between 1870 and 1965. And basically the Jim Crow laws are best known for their clause of separate but equal. So this is a situation where 
whites and blacks are segregated, but you have this phenomenon, I'm saying this with a high level of cynicism, because black public schools, public works, public places, and public spaces were grossly underfunded compared to their white counterparts. On top of that, black voter suppression was achieved through poll taxes, literacy, and comprehension tests. So by passing those two clauses to vote on top of the Jim Crow laws effectively led to zero black people voting. To be more exact, by 1910, only 0.5% of eligible black men were registered voters based on these restrictions. Now, it did affect poor white people as well, to be fair. A few thousand white people in the South were unable to vote due to the poll tax and the literacy comprehension test. However, they were later grandfathered in through a grandfather clause and were able to get back their right to vote despite not being able to meet these two requirements. And so here we have this tension where every time there is some movement along the path of black sovereignty and black equality, there is a violent opposition being perpetrated by the law enforcement at the time that leads eventually to change. And I want to share two more stories with you. And again, I ask you, tell me if this sounds familiar. These two stories, historians believe, are emblematic of what it was like to be a black American at that time and what really sparked the civil rights movement. The first story is about a man named Isaac Woodard. He was a World War II veteran. And on February 12th, 1946, he was honorably discharged from the United States Army and he was going back home on a Greyhound bus line. He had to use the bathroom and he asked the bus driver, excuse me, sir, may I uh, use the bathroom? They got into a little bit of an argument, allegedly, but the bus driver stopped and allowed Mr. Woodard to use a restroom. On the way back to the bus, the bus eventually stopped on Batesburg, South Carolina. The bus driver called the police and the police removed Mr. Woodard from the bus for disorderly conduct. They proceeded to take him into an alleyway, tell me if this sounds familiar, and beat him relentlessly. He went to jail on the grounds of drinking a beer on the bus. And the next morning, Mr. Wooder was blind. According to some reports, it looked like his eyes were gouged out and the orbs inside his eyes were ruptured. In the court hearings, Mr. Woodard said he was punched repeatedly in the eyes on the way to jail. And in jail, he was hit repeatedly in the eyes with billy clubs. The NAACP heard of this story and tried to pursue justice with the state of South Carolina. And after months of appeals, the state did nothing. NAACP then reached out to Mr. Orson Welles on ABC Radio and on four separate broadcasts. The state of South Carolina was condemned and shamed for their lack of action. Eventually, President Truman initiated a federal investigation on the sheriff who did this, Sheriff Linwood Shull, and he was tried. The sheriff was tried in federal court with a jury of all white peers. He was found not guilty. Now let's move on to 1955, the st uh, story of a little boy, 14 year old boy, African American boy named Emmett Till, who was in a corner store in Mississippi when he was visiting his family. Allegedly, he said some flirtatious words to the store clerk. Miss Bryant. And he was not allowed to say these things to a white woman. Later that night, Miss Bryant's husband and her brother-in-law kidnapped this child. 
lynched him mercilessly, shot him in the head, and dumped him in a river. Three days later, his body was found, and his mother, Mammy Till, decided to have an open casket so the world can see what the white people did to her son. It was a powerful image and it was a powerful sign because she turned her private grief into a public outcry. 100 days later, there was a woman on a Montgomery bus and she was asked to give up her seat to a white passenger. This woman remembered the images of Emmett Till and it was so ingrained in her mind on that day she decided to not get up and that woman was Rosa Parks and she told Mammy Till if it wasn't for your bravery and if it wasn't for what happened to your son I may not have had the courage to do what I did that day now these stories don't stop 1961, freedom riders, civil rights activists riding interstate buses to see if the Supreme Court's decision of Boynton versus Virginia that allowed non-segregation in buses through interstate travel would be upheld. They were kicked out of the bus and in Birmingham, Alabama, the public safety commissioner, Eugene O'Connor, gave the Ku Klux Klan 15 minutes to attack the riders before the police would come in and protect them. In 1963, Birmingham campaign and the Children's Crusade, same song, different verse. On May 2nd, a thousand high school students joined protesters at the 16th Street Baptist Church to go towards City Hall to protest segregation. Day one, the protesters were arrested. Day two, police dogs and fire hoses were unleashed on the protesters and on school children. 1964, the Harlem riots after a police shot an unarmed black teenager. 1965, Selma voting rights movement, Bloody Sunday, 600 protesters who were gonna peacefully march for their civil rights were tear gassed and attacked six blocks into their march. This goes on and on, the Wyatt rights of 1665, the Detroit rights, the New York rights, the Plainfield rights, the summer of riots in 1967. Every single major legal political victory for black Americans was preceded by violence towards black Americans. And time and time again, their righteous indignation has led to legislation. And here we are in 2020, the same thing over and over and over again. On the other hand, I must be honest enough to say uh, that I do feel that there are two types of laws. One is a just law and one is an unjust law. I think we all have moral obligations to obey just laws. On the other hand, I think we have moral obligations to disobey unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. I think the distinction here is that when one breaks a law the conscience tells him is unjust, he must do it openly, he must do it cheerfully, he must do it lovingly, he must do it civilly, not uncivilly, and he must do it with a willingness to accept the penalty. And any man who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail in order to arouse the conscience of the community on the injustice of the law is at that moment expressing the very highest respect for law. And I think it's worth to think about these issues from a sociological standpoint. I wanna talk about four things. Number one, the idea of the shame rage cycle proposed by Thomas J. Sheffs. This is a concept that when someone is made to feel shamed by another, that stresses the social bond. 
And no other group in our country has been made more ashamed of who they are and where they come from than the black community. And if the shame is not acknowledged, but instead negated or repressed, these feelings of shame become rage and eventually turn into outward aggression. And I invite you to think about and reflect on our US history and everything that we just outlined today happened in the last 154 years. That's two grandparents ago. That's nothing. And to say that all lives matter, and sure, sure, it does. And to say that there's just some bad apples and to say that we're blowing things out of proportion is to completely ignore the history of shame, of prejudice, and of violence towards the black community. Dr. Martin Luther King discussed this concept of just versus unjust laws. And though law enforcement is an important part of our society, we have a history of them enforcing unjust laws. And as citizens and as people, we must protest, we must rally against, and we must disobey unjust laws. Deal with the punishment that comes with it, but move the goalposts so that we eliminate these laws forever. Because crime and criminality are social construct. They're created by us. What we think is a crime, what we deem is a crime, is generated by the culture that we live in. And so when we pass a law, and when we label someone a criminal, and when we arrest someone for a crime, we need to take a long, hard look and think about, is this crime, is this unjust law, worth a human life is a counterfeit $20 bill worth a human life is selling cigarettes on the street worth a human life is a traffic stop worth taking a human life in front of his four year old daughter it's not it's not and I know that I'm not a police officer, and I know that there are atrocities that I'm not even aware of. And some of you might say, John, there's so much crime and terror in this world. If it wasn't for police, we would be living in an apocalyptic society. And that might be true. But I will tell you this, if you are a hammer, every problem is a nail. And the last point I want to talk about from a sociological standpoint is this idea of systemic versus systematic racism. And a lot of people will point out, John, there is no such thing as systematic racism. And I will grant you that there are no laws that says you are allowed to be racist. There are no laws that allow for systematic discrimination of people based on gender, race, creed, ethnicity. However, there is systemic racism. So there is no racist organization and racist laws that routinely enforce those laws. Not anymore, at least. But systemically, there is. And for you to understand that, we have to listen to the black community because their perception and their reality is very different from the white community, different from the Hispanic community, different from the Asian community. And there is a systemic racism there. It's in the, our history from the three fifths compromise, from the black codes, from separate but equal. This is a systemic belief that literally just ended in 1965. So to tell me that there is no implicit bias, that there is no systemic racism, is to literally turn a blind eye to the realities of black America. So what do we do? What do we do? I think what we're doing right now is a, is a start. Protest and have our voices be heard. And I think we need to focus on a few issues. I'm going to name 
two to three at the end of the show that now that we have the public stage, we can push forth this legislation. The first one is ending qualified immunity. All right. For those of you who don't know what qualified immunity is, it basically protects government officials from being personally liable while performing their duties, even if the victim's civil rights were violated. This has to go. This means that instead of hesitating and thinking, is there a better way to approach this? These bad apples, as we keep calling them, might immediately go to excessive force, might immediately go into violence to enforce the law. And that would be protected under the auspices of their official duties. And I think it's worth reflecting that when Officer Chauvin was kneeling on George Floyd's neck and when he was staring at the camera and he had a bunch of witnesses looking at what he was doing and he had his fellow officers do nothing about it I think he knew in some world he could get away with it I think he knew that in some world nothing would happen to him I want to believe that if this qualified immunity clause didn't exist, then maybe we would think twice about using that level of force for minor infractions. Maybe we wouldn't take a life so easily as part of, quote, doing our job. So let's focus on that. Second thing we need to focus on, police unions, extraordinarily powerful lobbying group so strong that it basically makes it impossible to fire these bad apples, okay? Worst case scenario, it takes forever to do internal review boards to have any level of um, prosecution on these individuals. And when they finally do get found guilty of misconduct, they just get reassigned somewhere else. So there's a system in place to protect these bad apples. And we can't have that anymore. We have to really rethink and re-engage how we view police unions. I wanna share a statistic with you guys. In 2013 to 2019, 7,663 people were killed by police. 25% of those people were black. Death at the hands of the police is the sixth leading cause of death in black men. And I don't want to hear anything about obesity and heart disease. We'll do CrossFit tomorrow, okay? Today, we're focusing on police brutality. If Doritos was the sixth leading cause of death in anybody, we would shut that shit down. I don't care how much you like Cool Ranch. Something has to be done. And something was done. In Camden, New Jersey, in 2012, I believe, they were the fifth leading city in terms of murder rates. In 2013, they disbanded their 141-year-old police department and restructured it from the ground up using two philosophies. The first one was community engagement. The second one was a highly detailed and specific 18-page policy on use of police force. Not only that, but originally the force was 115 individuals, police officers. After the restructuring, they had 400 police officers, all with less salary, all with less benefits. And what happened? Was there a war zone? Was there an apocalypse in Camden, New Jersey? Nope. In 2014, they had 45 complaints of police brutality. Between 2018 and 2019, they had three. So we have an example of a disbanding of a police department, restructuring, focusing on community and prevention of violence, focusing on connection with your, the people you serve, not subjugation of the people you serve, and they're doing all right. I wanna share with you a quote by a trial attorney that I think is worth considering, especially in the case of the Camden, New Jersey Police Department. A community that trusts police more, that's a community more inclined to give information to police about crime. 
partner with police about quality of life problems and help the police do what they need to do to keep people safe. Communities that don't trust the police have lower homicide clearance rates. There you go. And I think it's worth repeating that the police are not mental health counselors. They are not addiction specialists. They are not social workers. They are not medical professionals. They are not teachers. They need to be law enforcement and they need to judiciously and compassionately enforce the laws on the people that they are meant to serve. And so going back to our initial question, do we need the police? Whether the answer is yes or the answer is no, let the people decide. 